<laughs> Chapter 2, out from below. The people from the dying city of Amber had come up into the new world only a few days before. The first to arrive had been, Le had been Lena's Mayfleet and Dune Harrow, bringing Lena's little sister, Poppy, with them. From a ledge high up in the great cave that held their city, they'd thrown down a message hoping someone would find it and lead the others out. Then, they'd wait, they waited. At first, they explored the wonders around them. But as the hours passed, they began to worry that their message had not been found and that they would be alone in this world forever. Then, in the late afternoon of the next day, Dune suddenly shouted, Look, they're coming! Lena grabbed Poppy by the hand. All three of them ran toward the mouth of the cave. Who was it? Who was it coming from the home? From, a, from, the, from home. A woman emerged from darkness first and then the two men. And then three children. All of them squinting against the bright light. Hello, hello. Lena called leaping up, in the, uh, leaping up the hill. She saw who it was when she got closer. The family who ran the Cali Street Vegetable Market. The, she didn't know any of them well. She couldn't even remember their names. Yet, and yet, she was so glad to see them that tears sprang to her eyes. She flung her arms around each one in turn, crying, Here you are! Look, isn't it wonderful? Oh, I'm so glad you're here and more are coming. And more are coming? The new arrivals were too breathless and amazed to answer but it didn't matter because Lena could see for herself. They came out from the cave, shading their eyes with their hands. They came in bunches, a few of them, and then minutes later, a few more, stumbling out into a light a thousand times brighter than any they'd ever seen. They stared in astonishment, walked a few steps, and then stood, dropping the sacks and bundles they carried, graz gazing, blinking, to Lena and Dune, who felt already that they belonged th here, the refugees from Amber looked strange in this bright landscape of green grass and blue sky. They were so drab and dingy in their heavy mud-colored clothes, their coats and sweaters in colors like stone and dust and murky water. It was as if they had brought some of Ember's darkness with them. Dune suddenly leapt away, shouting, Father! Father! He threw himself against his stunned father, who, who fell backwards, sat down on the ground, and burst into a combination of laughter and weeping to see his son again. You are here, he gasped. I wasn't sure. I, I didn't know. All afternoon they came. Lizzie Bisco came, and others from the old high, old high class, along with Clary Lane from a greenhouse, and the other doctor who had helped Lena's granny and Sa Sage Murrow, who had tried to go out into the unknown regions. Ms. Myrtle came walking in her brisk, business-like way, but giving a cry of joy when she saw Lena hurtling toward her. People came whose faces Lena recognized, but whose names she didn't remember, like the shoe repairman from the... Levery Street, and the little puffy-faced woman who lived in Silverton Square, and the tall black-haired boy with blue-gray eyes so light they looked like glints of metal. What was that boy's name? She spent a second trying to recall it, but only a second. It didn't matter. These were her people, the people of Amber. All of them were tired, and all of them were thirsty. Lena showed them the little stream, and they splashed the water in their faces and filled their bottles there. What about the mayor, Lena asked Miss Myrtle, but she just shook her head. He's not with us, she said. Some of the old, older people looked terrified to be in such a huge place, a place that seemed to go on with, without borders in all directions. After they had stared nervously about them, after they had stared nervously about them for a while, they sat down in the grass, hundred, hunched over, and put their heads to their knees. But the children ran around in ecstasy, touching everything, smelling the air, splashing their feet in the stream. By evening, 417 people had arrived. Dune kept track. As the light began to fade from the sky, they shared the food they had brought. And then, using their coats as blankets and their bundles as pillows, they lay down on the warm, rough ground and slept. The next morning, they got ready to leave. Lena and Dune, when they first arrived, had spotted a narrow gray line that ran along the ground like a pencil stroke in the distance. They thought it might be a road. 
So the people of Amber, having no other clue about where to go, picked up their bundles and set out in that direction. A long, straggling line trailing across the hills. It was on this walk that Miss Myrtle told Lena and Dune about leaving Ember. The three of them walked together, Miss Myrtle and Poppy in her arms. Dune's father walked behind them, leaning forward now and then to hear what Miss Myrtle was saying. I was the one who found your message, Miss Myrtle said. It fell right at my feet. It was the day after the singing. I was on my way home from the market, feeling sick with worry because you and Poppy had disappeared. Then there was your message. She paused and looked up at the sky. She was keeping a couple of tears from falling. Lena saw. Miss Myrtle composed herself and went on. I thought it would be best to tell the mayor first. I wasn't sure I trusted him, but he was the one who could most easily organize the leaving. I showed him your message, and then I waited to hear the city clock ringing out the signal for a meeting. Miss Myrtle paused to catch her breath. They were going uphill over rough clumps of earth hard walking for the city people whose feet were accustomed to pavement. And was there a meeting? Lena asked. No, said Miss Myrtle. She plucked some, bur some burrs off her skirt and shifted Poppy to her other shoulder. Mercy, she said. It's terribly hot. She stood still for a moment, breathing hard. So there was no meeting? Lena prompted. Miss Myrtle started walking again. Nothing happened at all, she said. The clock couldn't shine. The guards didn't come out and start organizing people. Nothing. But the lights kept flickering on and off. It seemed to me there was no time to lose. So I went to the pipeworks and showed your message to Lister Monk. We followed the directions and we found the rock marked with E right away because people were, people were there already. But how could they be if they didn't have the directions, Dune said. Who was it? It was the mayor, said Miss Myrtle grimly, and four of his guards. Looper was there too. That boy who used to keep company with your friend Lizzie, they had huge bulging sacks with them, piled up on the edge of the river, and they were loading the sacks onto the boats. The mayor was shouting at them to work faster. Lister yelled, what are you doing? But we didn't need an answer. I could see what they were doing. They were going first. The mayor was making sure that he would get out, along with his friends and his loot, before anyone else. Miss Myrtle stopped talking. She trudged along, wiping sweat from her forehead. She frowned up the, at the hot, bright sky. Poppy whimpered. Let me carry the child for a while, Miss Myrtle, said Dune's father. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Miss Myrtle said. She stopped and passed the squirming Poppy to Dune's father, and they walked on. Lena waited a minute or so, and then she walked. She couldn't wa wait any longer. Well, what happened, she said. It was awful, Miss Myrtle said. Everything happened at once. Two of the guards looked up at us and lost their balance and fell into the water. They grabbed hold of the loaded boats, which made the boats tip and dumped their load into the river. The other guards and Looper knelt down and tried to reach them, but they, would pu they were pulled in, too. In the midst of all of this, the mayor jumped onto one of the boats that was still upright, but as soon as he hit it, it turned over and he plunged into the river. Miss Myrtle shuddered. He screamed, he screamed, children. It was a horrible sound. He, ha he bobbed in the water like a giant cork and then he went under. It was a few seconds he and the guards were swept away. They were gone. They walked in silence for a while, going downhill now. After a few minutes, Miss Myrtle went on. So Lester and I... <clears throat> went up into the city and we had the timekeeper ring the bell for a public meeting. We tried to explain what to do, but as soon as people heard the first bit that a way out of amber had been found and that it was in the pipeworks, everyone began shouting and rushing around. Things turned into a terrible mess. People were in too much of a hurry even to ask questions. Hundreds of them poured through the streets of the city all at once. Outside of the door of the pipeworks, a huge crowd pushed and shoved to get in. So many people so panicky that some were trampled and crushed. Oh, cried Lena, how horrible. There were people she knew. It was too awful to think about. Horrible indeed, said Miss Myrtle. She frowned out across the vast landscape surrounding them where there were no people in sight at all. It was impossible to control them, she went on. 
They rushed to the stairway. Some people lost their footing and fell all the way down to the, all the, the way down the stairs. Others ran right over them. And then when they realized that they were going to have to get into these little shells and float on the river, some people were so frightened that they turned around and tried to go up the stairs again. And some were so eager to get going that they jumped into the boat and capsized them and fell into the river and were drowned. She raised her eyes to Lena. I saw everything that happened, she said. I'll never forget it. Lena looked behind her at the citizens of Ember toiling across the hills. These were the ones who had made it out. How many do you think were left behind? She asked Miss Myrtle. Miss Myrtle just shook her head. I don't know, she said. Too many. And have the lights gone out forever now? I don't know that either. But if they haven't, they will soon. Hot as she was, Lena shuddered. She and Dune exchanged a look. They were thinking the same thing. She was sure. Their city was lost in darkness now. And anyone there was lost too. Later that day, the refugees from Amber came to the road they had seen from afar. It was, a, it was potholed and weed cracked, but easier to walk on than the rough ground. It led alongside a creek that, followed, that flowed swiftly over round, smooth rocks. In all directions, they saw nothing but endless exp expanses of grass. They shared the food they had brought with them, but it wasn't much. Some of them soon grew weak with hunger. They grew faint from the heat, too, which was hard to bear for people used to the constant chill of Ember. Poppy cried when she was set down on her feet, and her face looked flushed and hot. Night came in the strange gradual way, so different from the sudden light out that signaled night in Ember. The travelers lay down on the ground and slept. They walked the next day, too, and the day after that. By then, the food they had brought with them was gone. They traveled more and more slowly, stopping often to rest. Poppy was listless. Her eyes were dull. Finally, around the middle of the following day, they trudged up still another hill. And from there, they saw a sight that made many of them weep with relief. Farmed fields lay below them in a wide valley. And beyond the fields, where the stream they'd been following joined the river, was a cluster of low brown buildings. It was a place where people lived. Like the others, Lena was glad to see it, but it wasn't a bit like the city they had, she had imagined. The one she'd draw picture, pictures of back in Amber, the one she'd hoped to find in this new world. The building of the city had been tall and majestic and sparkling with lights. That city must be somewhere else, she thought, as she started down the hill. She'd find it, not today, but someday, 